sure all of you are very familiar with Dr. Ritchie uh, as he is a legend in podiatry. He is a clinical associate professor at the California School of Podiatric Medicine. As you know, he's authored several articles in peer-reviewed medical journals, as well as chapters of textbooks. And you can also go to, if you go to our Practice Partner Academy webpage, you can see a link uh, where you can check out his a recent textbook, Pathomechanics of Common Foot Disorders. Um, Dr. Rishi is a fellow and past president of the American Academy of Podiatric Sports Medicine. He is a fellow of the American College of Foot and Ankle Surgeons. And as you know, he has designed and launched the gold standard of AFOs, the Ritchie Brace in 1996. And here we are 2023. So it's not the shortest amount of time. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So I am going to hide myself, mute myself. I'm not going to take up any real estate here. And I'm going to let you take the reins, Dr. Ritchie. Well, thank you, Sarah. And it's a pleasure to be back uh, <clears throat> doing another webinar with your organization. I chose this topic uh, mainly because it's, it's been a special interest of mine for a large part of my career. And it's also a, a controversial uh, topic and one that uh, always stimulates interest. So hopefully all of those things will happen here tonight as we explore the connection between the pediatric flat foot and the adult acquired flat foot. Um, as I said, I've, I've spent the last 20 years researching and I've actually published several articles relative to uh, what at that time we called the adult acquired flat foot and just recently published an article uh, dealing with the isolated spring ligament injury, which ultimately leads to the progressive collapsing foot deformity itself. And in my research and my continued interest in the subject, I always go back to the pediatric flat foot because I wanna to try to figure out what really causes the adult acquired flat foot and what perhaps might we do to prevent this uh, very disabling progressive condition in middle age to older adults. This recent publication, this Cochrane review that was published in 2022 caught my eye uh, for many reasons. Um, uh, th this focused on foot orthoses treating the pediatric flat foot. And uh, as many of you know, these reviews are considered a gold standard and are often referred to by third party insurance payers because they very accurately summarize the published research and from the insurance company standpoints gives a uh, verification or a refutation of certain treatment interventions based on uh, evidence in the literature about their efficacy. And one of the remarks by the authors really caught my eye saying the agenda for researching asymptomatic flat feet in healthy children is now firmly closed as there is no justification for wasting research and healthcare resources on flat feet and healthy children that do not hurt. And I'm here uh, presenting this webinar because I believe that we do need further research, uh, whether the child is symptomatic or asymptomatic to try to earmark and understand which children do go on to disabling foot conditions, specifically the adult acquired flat foot. You know, uh, also rather recently in 2017, a very good systematic review of uh, research looking at the, uh, the progression of maturation of the pediatric uh, foot from a, uh, a, an, a flat foot posture to a relatively normal arched foot uh, with many articles uh, studied in this systematic review. And some of the conclusions that were made uh, verify what many of you already know is that most developing children will have a flat foot at birth but then the flat foot gradually resolves up till around age nine to 12. And the research that was in this uh, summary showed that a normal foot posture actually is a flat foot, according to much of the research that's published. And therefore a flat foot, at least up till age nine is considered normal. But much of the research in that, uh, in that systematic review was looking at static foot posture. And I was intrigued by these uh, stellar researchers, all of whom I greatly uh, admire 
for their work over the years, not only in pediatric flat foot, but in lower extremity uh, biomechanics. They came forward with a response to that systematic review and made some interesting statements. They said, we challenge the idea that the primary issue is how flat the foot is and even whether it is meaningful to call it flat. Evidence shows that the foot shape is characterized by age-specific anatomic and etiological factors, yet most clinical concerns are physiological, non-pathological, and often not requiring intervention. The developing foot is not structurally flat. It is actually highly compliant plastic and a developing structure which responds to multiple determinants, many of which we do not understand. And this group cited a recent work, reference number three, which used MR imaging to evaluate subtalar joint morphology. And this study demonstrated a relationship between the absence of the anterior subtalar joint facet and the development of the arch complex in a child. This work highlights the need to constantly challenge the foundations of our existing knowledge and ensure clinical concepts are driven by research outcomes. So I looked at reference number three into the uh, etiology of flexible flat feet and it kind of opened up a Pandora's box, which is really what it is encapsulated in this presentation, where we're gonna look specifically at a new joint complex, not the subtalar joint, and try to understand it's the, the connectivity between the pediatric flat foot and the adult acquired flat foot. So yes, all of us are born with flat feet. And we know that with various measures, we see a progression from the flat foot to a relatively normal arched foot in most children. But we have to understand first, when we look at, quote, flat foot deformity, most researchers and clinicians are looking at the medial longitudinal arch, which is just a small two-dimensional view of what we now understand are multiple arch structures within the foot. Early studies use simple footprint-based measures, looking at measurements such as the arch index, and looked at the progression of the development of the arch in a growing child. Later, other measurements taken, such as the rear foot angle, documented improvements of alignment from birth up until age nine. But these are really a, almost a one-dimensional measurement, either frontal plane, sagittal plane, or transverse plane. And it really disregards the complexity of the multiplanar motion of the foot, these static images. For example, we're getting more insight into the mul multiple arch structures of the foot, specifically the transverse tarsal arch. And there's accumulating evidence that this transverse tarsal arch is really imparting more uh, stiffness to the human foot during gait than either the medial longitudinal arch or the lateral longitudinal arch. And certainly these studies of arch development that are uh, cited in literature, none of them have looked at the transverse tarsal arch. The lateral longitudinal arch is a, a very important fundamental structure during gait as it transfers load from lateral to medial and uh, it really initiates an efficient push off. And there's really been no studies that I've seen looking at the lateral longitudinal arch. So we, in, in short, we've looked at these two dimensional measurements and the only useful multiplanar measurement to this date, but it is still a static measurement, is the foot posture index. For those of you who are not familiar, this was developed by Anthony Redman and Associates and published back in 2006. It has since undergone many uh, studies that have verified its reliability, its intra and inter-rater reliability in assessing foot posture. But more importantly for this discussion, it has been uh, rated as a reliable assessment of foot posture in the pediatric population. Basically, it's a, a six uh, factor evaluation of various uh, alignment features of the foot and static stance. But just briefly, uh, num uh, step number one is palpating the tail or head. Number two, looking at the curvature above and below the lateral malleolus. 
looking at the calcaneal frontal plane position, the relaxed calcaneal stance position relative to the floor. Looking at bulging and prominence of the talonavicular joint, looking at the congruence or height of the medial longitudinal arch, looking at the adduction or abduction of the forefoot on the rear foot in the transverse plane. A scoring system is used of minus two to plus two for each factor. And the combined scores are put together to classify the foot as either normal, pronated, or supinated based on the accumulated score. In this article from Morrison, they summarized that the accumulated score of zero to five would be a so-called neutral foot. We avoid the word normal foot, but neutral foot, neither pronated, which is a, a score of six to nine, or a supinated foot posture, which is minus one to minus four. So we wanna keep in mind that this neutral foot would fall in a category of zero to five, um, it, with this rating system of the um, <clears throat> of the um, foot posture index, of interest are a series of studies uh, performed by some Spanish uh, uh, investigators, along with Angela Evans from Australia, looking at normative data using the foot posture index, and then a subsequent study looking at the progression. So this first paper looked at a sample of, a large sample of 3,217 children and used the foot posture index to look at uh, normative data among these children. This is the frequency plot from that study. And the conclusions were the following. The patient said that um, <clears throat> the main finding is to denounce the pediatric flat foot as deviant. The study confirms that a flat or pronated foot is the common foot posture of childhood. And they go on to say that the foot posture index score of plus four was the average finding. Keep in mind, as I just told you, the foot posture index of a plus four is not pronated. According to the uh, innovators of the foot posture index, a, a score of plus four is neutral, not pronated. And therefore in this study, the um, the finding of an average score or a mean score of plus four confirms that the pronated foot is not, not normal or common um, or prevailing in this uh, population average 10 years of age. A subsequent study prospective looked at the three-year changes of the foot posture index over time in again a very large sample of 1,032 healthy children. These were healthy children uh, with other pathologies excluded. Uh, <clears throat> they said that the average foot posture index of this large sample was four. That would again be a neutral foot, not a pronated foot. The foot posture index though had a very wide range from either plus one to plus seven. And 95% of the of patients fell between a range of minus two and plus 10, which is quite large. The researchers concluded that a pronated foot posture category can be expected in children age less than nine and expected to reduce in some but all, not all cases as they followed these children over a period of three years. Keep in mind that the data from this study showed that the mean foot posture index of less than nine years of age was not pronated, but was actually neutral. How much did they change over three years? The actual foot posture index change over three years was 0.2. In this study, the researchers compared boys to girls and found that the only difference was 0.2. And they said a difference of 0.2 was actually, quote, clinically indistinguishable. So if over a period of three years, these children were supposed to be notably improving in their foot posture, why would the a factor of 0.2 be clinically indistinguishable? Raises many questions in my mind. So does the foot posture index reduce with age? Yes, it does with a large segment of the growing children population. But there's a subgroup of patients in these studies with highly pronated feet. And it's those patients that I'm interested in. Even these researchers warn that patients with joint hypermobility, connective tissue disorders, 
altered neurologic tone or other muscular conditions should be monitored by clinicians. If we look at their, uh, their frequency plots, I'm interested in everybody from five to 10 or higher because they have pronated feet at age 10. And at age 10, these pronated feet have not improved to a, a quote, neutral range. They are pronated. And during this three-year period, comparing the left-hand graph to the right-hand graph, we still see a significant number of patients that lie in plus five or higher. They have pronated feet. Some of them may be symptomatic, some be asymptomatic, but I'm interested in what these patients look like and what they end up looking like when they become adults. So a mean foot posture index of children under age 10 is actually neutral according to these studies, but they have a wide range in the foot posture index. And there are significant numbers in this, in this general population with severely pronated feet. Children with moderate to severe pronated feet do not always improve and achieve a neutral or normative foot posture as evidenced by these two studies. So if we go back to Morrison and Nestor, when they look at, look at these studies of progression of foot posture, they said it's time for us to look beyond just the simple medial longitudinal arch and really look at the foot as a three-dimensional complex and look at the growth and morphology and other anthropometric and functional norms that affect the growing child. And indeed, there are studies of these children with flat feet that go beyond just looking at simple posture of the foot in two dimensions. Several interesting studies have been published of gait analysis, looking at symptomatic and asymptomatic children with flat foot deformity. This was an interesting study published <clears throat> in clinics and orthopedic surgery in 2017. They found that in children with symptomatic plano valgus, they began to show evidence of midfoot breakage, even at a very young age, an unstable mid-tarsal joint. And they found that the lever arm for propulsion was shortened in the foot because of midfoot breakage, necessitating the children to generate greater muscle activity and force to achieve push-off. Very interesting that these children, if I go back, um, they were a mean age of 9.5 years, were already showing midfoot instability, which is a hallmark of the adult acquired flat foot in gait studies we see in a much older population. These researchers in this study um, acknowledge that pes plano valgus is a common foot deformity in growing children and it doesn't always cause symptoms and may eventually improve. But the researchers point out that just from a kinematic standpoint, pes plano valgus is a, a exhibiting lever instability from the perspective of kinetics, which could later elicit symptoms of greater uh, muscle fatigue after long distance gait. Evaluation of functional loss due to kinetic energy loss in gait in these children could be equally important to morphologic indicators in assessing children with pes plano valgus. So we really get back to this concept of symptomatic versus asymptomatic children. And in many of the studies, pain is the primary criteria, but symptoms are not always exhibited by, certain, by pain alone. An interesting study published by Kothari in 2014 looked at pain, but other health-related quality of life measurements in growing children who had flexible flat foot deformity. They used the Oxford ankle foot questionnaire for children and the pediatric quality of life inventory. Both of these tools assess activities of daily living in children as it relates to home, school, as well as their emotional well-being and, um, and pain. In this study, Children with pediatric flexible flat foot had significantly lower mean scores in the uh, uh, activities of daily living and quality of life uh, instruments. Of most importance was the physical domain and the extra question with patients with flat foot deformity scoring 20% less than those with typically developing uh, a foot posture. The researchers concluded that in respect to physical functioning, 
the belief that patients with pediatric flexible flat foot can not only always be regarded as just a normal benign variation. The diagnosis of pediatric flexible flat foot alone is not enough to guide clinical management and careful consideration should be given to the child's symptom profile and other health-related quality of life measures. These same researchers did a kinematic study looking at proximal joint uh, function in children with, with flexible flat foot deformity. And they found indeed the height of the arch was a significant predictor of knee symptoms, hip and back symptoms in the study participants. Another study by Hassel and Associates looking at symptomatic and asymptomatic flat feet in a multi-segmented foot model study found that there were significant uh, correlations of deviations of normal kinematic function in children with uh, both symptomatic and asymptomatic flat foot deformity. One of the leading indicators were reduced hind foot dorsiflexion. And as I'm gonna show you uh, repeatedly in this webinar, increased forefoot abduction. So if we review all these systematic reviews and studies of progression of the pediatric flat foot, indeed flat foot deformity usually responds by, in most cases, by age 10. The majority of children with flat feet have a flexible deformity, which is asymptomatic. Researchers usually conclude that treatment of the asymptomatic child is not warranted, However, most authorities agree that a subgroup of asymptomatic children with flat foot can develop symptoms later in life. That's the subgroup that I'm interested in. Which children with asymptomatic flat foot deformity will go on to develop significant pathologies in their lower extremities later in life? We know in the literature there are multiple studies and opinion pieces written correlating the presence of flat foot deformity, and other pathologies. Other pathologies such as lower back pain, generalized foot pain, hallux abducto valgus, and development of degenerative joint disease in the foot and ankle complex. Which child with residual flat foot deformity will go on to the progressive collapsing foot deformity, aka adult acquired flat foot? Adult acquired flat foot, it used to be known as posterior tibial tendon dysfunction, is a progressive deformity. And as we now know, it originates from talocalcaneal and navicular joint instability that then leads to reactive tendinopathy and progressive uh, loss of integrity of ligamentous structures which support the arch and the hind foot. Back when PTTD was first described in the early 80s, a correlation was already shown between patients who developed PTD and had a history of pediatric flat foot deformity. Up to 90% of patients with PTD uh, stated that they had flat feet all of their life since childhood, as all of these researchers uh, documented in the early papers. But the idea that the flat foot led to the rupture of the posterior tibial tendon, and then that led to progressive collapse of the foot, has now been dispelled by numerous MRI studies, leading a group, a, a blue ribbon panel of uh, authoritative foot and ankle surgeons around the world to gather in 2020 and abandon the concept of posterior tibial tendon dysfunction and instead describe the condition as a progressive collapsing foot deformity due to progressive ligamentous disruption, not specific tendinopathy or tendon rupture. So what causes these ligaments to rupture and cause the progressive debilitating collapsing foot deformity? An emerging theory, as I pointed out, is that joint instability precedes failure of multiple ligament structures. Anatomic deficits have been identified now, which are unique to the adult acquired flat foot via multiplanar weight bearing CT imaging. The question now is whether certain ligaments fail to develop early in life in the pediatric flat foot. And most importantly, whether there's an inherent instability of the pediatric foot, which later in life 
causes tendinopathy, tendon rupture, and then ligamentous rupture. I was part of a group of authors that just submitted a paper to a foot and ankle surgical journal that kind of summarized this new pathomechanics paradigm. And I'm gonna just summarize in short, the basic idea is that we believe that there is ligament instability in a younger patient that then leads to joint deformity, tendon overload, and then a eventual rupture of ligaments and progressive joint degeneration. And furthermore, we think that this all originates not at the subtalar joint, but at a joint that some of some people refer to as the talonavicular joint, but as what should, as I'm about to introduce the concept of the talocalcaneonavicular joint. Angela Evans, who is a critic of treating asymptomatic uh, flat feet, does point out in a very good paper called the Boomerangs in the Journal of the American Podiatric Medical Association two years ago, pointed out three earmarks that may designate or may um, be a clue to certain children going on to develop pathology later in life. One, which we often look at is the valgus heel, but in her mind has to be greater than 10 degrees everted in a resting position based on one study but she cites two quality studies where abnormal talonavicular joint coverage can predict for both symptoms in the pediatric flat foot and perhaps the development of pathology later in life. The first paper was published by Morliata and Scott Mubarak, where they looked at radiographic findings of symptomatic versus asymptomatic children. And the only thing that, did, that earmarked the symptomatic children from the asymptomatic children, both of whom had flat feet, was the severity of lateral displacement of the navicular over the talus as seen on the AP x-ray. The so-called talonavicular joint uncoverage angle, which is an angle we, we commonly draw on adult x-rays, particularly with preoperative planning to correct the adult acquired flat foot. That joint was the only joint radiographically that clearly um, separated symptomatic from asymptomatic children in terms of the severity of the angle. Another study published in the Chinese Medical Journal uh, 10 years ago by Yan and co-workers also found that lateral displacement of the navicular on the AP x-ray was the one of radiographic finding most related to the onset of symptoms in children with flexible flat foot deformity. It wasn't the, uh, the, <clears throat> the um, talonavicular or talus first metatarsal miris angle. It was not the calcaneal inclination angle. It was the right-hand picture, the talonavicular joint coverage angle. So it's this joint, the talonavicular joint, and the transverse plane abduction, which in the younger child seems at least radiographically to begin to designate these children as not only being symptomatic as a child, but perhaps going on to develop symptoms later in life. Jan, who published that radiographic study, quotes Scarpa, who saw similarities in the subtalar joint complex and the hip joint. And Scarpa describes a cup-like structure of the anterior middle facet of the calcaneus, as well as the navicular and the, and the spring ligament. And I was familiar with Scarpa and his work when I wrote the chapter on adult acquired flat foot and the development of the of embryonic foot, because I found it so interesting. And so this ties into something that I had written in my book and that I'm gonna bring into this lecture right now. And it's a group, not just Scarpa, but other, interestingly, Italian anatomists and orthopedic surgeons who use this term, the acetabulum pedis, to describe this unique feature of the human foot, which was never described to me when I was in podiatric medical school, and I rarely hear it described from the podium in surgical lectures. Um, <clears throat> this was originally described way back in 1818, Redescribed in 1989 and then again in 1995, all by Italian orthopedic surgeons or anatomists. The reason I'm bringing this up is because I'm trying to dispel this myth of the importance of the subtalar joint and flat foot deformity. 
a commonly held myth is that the flat foot deformity is, is really created by and pivoted over the subtalar joint. And the subtalar joint is the key pivotal joint of the flat foot. But we have to realize that the, nobody really understands what is the true anatomic subtalar joint. The subtalar joint axis allows primarily inversion, eversion, a frontal plane motion. And yet we understand now, as I've already shown you, that the earmark of the pediatric flat foot is a transverse plane deformity, not at the subtalar joint, but at the talonavicular joint. And indeed, in terms of importance, if we look at kinematic studies, such as this one by Chris Nestor, that the total motion of the joints comparing the talonavicular joint to the subtalar joint is markedly different. The talonavicular joint has twice the amount of motion during gait than the subtalar joint. And in terms of even frontal plane motion, it has almost double the amount of motion. So when we look at which joint moves the most in the human foot during gait, it is clearly the talonavicular joint, not the subtalar joint. But let's go back to this, this concept of the acetabulum pedis, because it's very interesting, and it's really the cornerstone of what I want to share with you in this webinar. So this is a great picture of the acetabulum pedis, this cup-like structure that's formed by both the uh, the cup of the navicular, as well as the spring ligament complex. It's a truly an osteoligamentous cup-like structure, half ligament, half bone. Now the subtalar joint does come into play here because many people describe the subtalar joint as having three facets or three different facets, anterior, middle, and posterior. But as these researchers that I just quoted have shown, the subtalar joint really should be considered the posterior facet of the talocalcaneal joint. It's the facet in green. And it is separated anatomically by an osseous canal, the, the tarsal canal, and also by the interosseous talocalcaneal ligament. And in the front are two facets, the middle and anterior facet, and then this acetabulum pedis. It is that joint, which is called the talocalcaneonavicular joint, which is anatomically separate from the, the subtalar joint. It's separated by distinct ligaments. And we found by uh, the work of, uh, I'm about to show you, that the anterior portion of this joint develops embryologically separate and distinctly different than the posterior facet of the subtalar joint. And as I'm about to show you, it's the anterior part of this joint that is the primary location of instability in the adult acquired flat foot. This is a great anatomic drawing of a cadaver specimen where the talus has been taken out of the foot and we're looking down into the acetabulum pedis. Number one is the cup of the navicular. Number six is the inferior calcaneonavicular ligament. Number five is the superomedial calcaneal navicular ligament. And these two together form the spring ligament complex. Number three is the middle facet and number two is the anterior facet of the talocalcaneal joint. Number four, distinctly separate and removed is the posterior facet of the subtalar joint. The spring ligament complex performs or functions as an inferior in a medial supportive role of the acetabulum pedis. The most important of the spring ligaments is the superomedial calcaneal navicular ligament shown here. It originates on the sustentaculum tali. It, for, it, it traverses under the head of the talus, which we don't see the talus here, and it anchors firmly onto the inferior surface of the cup of the navicular. A great fluoroscopic image of the foot, talus is removed. Here is the spring ligament, the superomedial calcaneal ligament, and the uh, cup-like structure of the navicular. That is the acetabulum pedis. Other really cool drawings of that with the uh, uh, talus removed. And not to mention the important supportive role of the tibialis posterior tendon, as well as the a superficial deltoid ligament, all of whom come in and reinforce medially 
the uh, acetabulum pedis in a soft tissue structure. Now, Pisani described this even further. Instead of using the word acetabulum pedis, he used the word coxa pedis to try to draw a similarity to the hip of the human body. He too drew the same, or had did the same anatomic uh, specimens, removing the talus and showing the distinct separation of the posterior facet from the middle and anterior facet. But he also showed in an embryologic phase the advanced development of the talonavicular, I'm going to back up, talonavicular and anterior facet of the subtalar joint distinctly anatomically advanced ahead of the posterior facet of the subtalar joint and separated clearly. This, is, this develops in a more advanced fashion than the posterior facet, and as I'm showing you, functions in a much different fashion. So Pisani shows this interesting relationship between the hip and the tibia and the talus. He draws a likeness between the, the, the tibia, which is the long shaft of the femur, and the talus, which is the head and neck of the femur. And he shows how the talus, which is really the head of the femur, fitting into the socket of the coxa pedis or the acetabulum pedis. And he shows how the combination of the tibia and the talus can become unstable at the navicular, just as it can in the hip joint. He was not the only one to embrace this concept. Just recently, a group of pediatric surgeons published in the Journal of Children's Orthopedics this unique role of what they call the calcaneopedal unit. They separate the com combination of the tibia and the talus from the rest of the foot. And again, they show this calcaneonavicular ligament and this support of the acetabulum pedis for the overlying tibio-navicular uh, segment. And what does this have to do with the adult acquired flat foot? Well, more and more, we're beginning to see that it's in the acetabulum pedis where the subluxation occurs. If any of you are staying abreast of the literature, we've seen a large number of studies published using weight-bearing CT imaging to look at the multiplanar changes in the adult acquired flat foot giving us insight that we can never gain before from two-dimensional CT imaging or MR imaging. And with weight-bearing CT, we see how the joints shift and move in three planes from a semi-weight-bearing to a full weight-bearing position. This was a study of a group of patients with adult-acquired flat foot compared to patients, healthy patients. And when they uh, bore weight, the patients with adult acquired flat foot showed that the majority of the subluxation occurs at the middle facet of the, of the so-called subtalar joint, or as we will say, the, uh, the acetabulum pedis or the talocalcaneo navicular joint. This is where the subluxation occurs, not in the posterior facet of the subtalar joint. As I was preparing this webinar, I found this paper that just got published uh, last week uh, in the Journal of Orthopedic Research by a group of orthopedic surgeons, again, using weight-bearing CT, looking at patients with what we now call the progressive collapsing foot deformity. And indeed, it was the anterior medial facet of the subtalar joint that loses coverage, that subluxes. It is that joint that is slipping the most in the adult acquired flat foot. It's not the posterior facet of the subtalar joint. And these are their images, which I don't have time to go into. And so that takes me back to reference number three when I started my, uh, this webinar. And that was this study on subtalar joint morphology and looking at patients between the age of eight and 15 years. So these are adolescent kids. And this study was performed by Kothari. I've already shown two other papers that Kothari conducted on pediatric flat foot, where they cautioned that just simply looking at the medial longitudinal arch and simply looking at symptoms 
wasn't adequate in terms of assessing whether these children were at risk for going on and developing problems later in life. This study, which was published in the prestigious joint, uh, uh, Journal of Bone and Joint Surgery in 2016, showed a very interesting finding, the first time ever differentiating an anatomic difference between children who have flexible flat feet and uh, children who have, quote, relatively normal foot structure. And the difference was in the anterior and middle facet of the subtalar joint. We have found that all of us, and starting with children, can have variations in how the anterior medial facet develop. Some of us lack an anterior facet altogether. Some of us have the normal, well-differentiated di anterior middle, and some have a blended facet, and the angle of the facet and the stability of the facet can vary significantly among even children. And in this study of adolescent children, an absent anterior facet, which would be this particular foot type on the right, in these researchers' minds, places greater reliance on the plantar ligaments to support the head of the talus. That would be the spring ligament. They speculated over time, these ligaments, the spring ligament complex may stretch, allowing further plantar and medial deviation of the head of the talus, which then causes reduction of the medial longitudinal arch that we see in the collapsing adult foot deformity. So for the first time now, we see that there are certain subtypes of pediatric patients who have an anatomic deficit, which may lead to strain on the spring ligament complex and gradual ad, uh, um, <clears throat> acquiring of a flat foot, progressive collapsing flat foot later in life. So it seems as though failure of development of the talonavicular acetabulum and spring ligament could be a process that begins early in life and may explain the onset of the adult acquired flat foot. This has only been suggested by one study, but I think it has credibility. How could we detect whether there is laxity of the spring ligament complex in any patient? Well, this has already been verified in a very good study by Chandra Pasapula in the UK, where he developed a very simple test called the neutral heel lateral push test, where, he, where you can test any patient for insufficiency of the spring ligament. You put a, a counter pressure on the lateral aspect of the body of the calcaneus and you simply abduct the forefoot on the rear foot in the transverse plane. You compare one foot to the other and you look for laxity or excessive mobility of the forefoot on the rear foot. You can do this under fluoroscopy or radiography to see why certain feet have severe transverse plane subluxation with loading in the transverse plane, but you can oftentimes visualize it or feel it. This is a video uh, that uh, Chandra sent me demonstrating a patient who has a flexible flat foot that can easily perform the single foot heel rise test, yet has significant instability of the combined talocalcaneal navicular joint with the lateral push test. Look at this unilateral extreme excursion in the transverse plane of the left foot compared to the right. The right is a normal foot, left is a hypermobile foot across the talonavicular joint, the lateral foot test. So my theory is, and this is purely a theory, is that we know that these children develop their acetabulum pedis after birth. We know that at age five months, the, tail, the, the head of the talus and neck of the talus are still significantly adducted. And over time, they abduct, the, the head of the talus abducts to become congruent with the navicular. There's also a frontal plane rotation of the head of the talus from age five months to seven months to an adult, which is really age 12, all of which bring the head of the talus into the navicular for congruency. Now, Chandra Pasapula, as well as Kothari and others speculate 
that if the head of the TLS doesn't uh, progressively develop and reach the socket of the navicular, there then is a lack of progressive osteoligamentous development. So if the head of the TLS stays medially displaced and doesn't fit into the socket, as it does in this developing foot here, there's reason to believe that the spring ligament and the other ligamentous structures may not develop and, and uh, achieve integrity of this entire joint complex. <clears throat> and that therefore could lead to the progressive collapsing foot deformity. This has nothing to do with the subtalar joint. The navicular is the final bone of the foot to ossify. We don't see it on x-ray until at least age five. So that means up till age five, it is very soft, developing uh, cartilaginous structure that can be influenced by the pressure of the head of the talus and could be influenced and be influenced as well by the development of the spring ligament complex around it. So as we take an x-ray of a child under the age of five, we don't even see the navicular because it's all cartilage and now it's ossified. This critical stage between here is when this joint really further solidifies. Now back to, um, uh, to the Italian researchers who drew this analogy of the hip. We know that children who have a, uh, a congenital instability of the hip socket will go on later in life to develop hip dysplasia, early onset of degenerative arthritis, and for sure instability of the hip because if the hip is not properly seated in its socket at birth, the ligaments do not develop around it and the socket itself remains shallow. It never forms the deep normal socket that it's supposed to form. So developmental dysplasia of the hip is something that is detected at birth and unless, if it's not detected early, significant disability occurs later in life. Well, now some researchers are pointing to a similarity perhaps in the human foot where an instability of the talocalcaneal navicular joint undetected may lead to instability of that joint and lack of maturation of both the uh, navicular and the spring ligament complex. We know that if you take a child with a, a congenital hip dysplasia and brace them, even just for a few months, the socket develops. The socket uh, forms a nice deep acetabulum and the ligaments begin to solidify around and a child with a, with a dysplasia can become quote normal uh, before they begin ambulating. So that's an interesting concept that might come into play in, the, in some children in the foot. Now, this is all very speculative. I have no data to support this. I am simply throwing this out as something for future research. Uh, Angela Evans in her paper said, there's no need for any further research on children and pediatric flat feet. And I think there's ample opportunity for future research to begin to figure out what happens to these children uh, that aren't treated and, and what treatments we could uh, bring into play at an early stage, not necessarily foot orthotic therapy, there are orthopedic surgeons who condemn and state there is no evidence that longitudinal arch supports, uh, any external support can influence the development of the arch. And there isn't evidence, but maybe we're missing the boat. Maybe there's other things we could do to encourage development of a specific joint, in this case, the acetabulum pedis. We know surgically, if you put a subtalar arthroaresis in a developing child, who has a flat foot deformity and you remove the arthroresis three to five years later, the correction maintains. So we know that the ligaments can solidify if the foot is held in a stable position. This is just one study. There's many studies showing the results of surgical arthroresis and the long-term results that are maintained even after the arthroresis is removed. Am I recommending all children get an arthroresis? No. I'm recommending that we explore if non-operative interventions might achieve the same result at a critical stage in the development of the child who has flat foot deformity. So what I'm suggesting is develop is recognize that the osteoligamentous complex 
known as the talocalcaneal navicular joint, is not fully formed in the newborn infant. It takes about four to five years after birth for this critical joint and the ligaments to develop. We know that in the hip, dysplasia causes permanent instability. The question is, will dysplasia of the talocalcaneal navicular joint lead to instability? Therefore, what we need is a longitudinal study of pediatric patients with dysplasia and see if these patients, which patients eventually undergo attrition of the spring ligament and eventual development of the progressive collapsing foot deformity. And even more important, we need longitudinal studies of the effects of treatment interventions, which can hopefully prevent the development of progressive collapsing foot deformity. We don't have good longitudinal studies in children or even in adolescents all the way up to adulthood and correlating them with those who do develop posterior tibial tendon dysfunction. Now, I'm just gonna close with one thing that we do know, and but this is specific to the adult acquired flat foot. And, and I'm not saying that, that the Ritchie brace is indicated for uh, young growing children, but at least taught me the importance of stabilizing the tibia and the talus together with an AFO in treating adults with instability of the talocalcaneal navicular joint. And so when we look at the adult acquired flat foot, it is a multiplanar complex deformity. But over time, we began to realize that if we could control tibial rotation, we could control rotation of the talus at the navicular. Um, we stopped looking at just underneath the foot and controlling calcaneal eversion. We started looking at controlling the tibia and the talus. And this is a whole other lecture, which I did previously, and I'll probably do again, that's related to a great uh, Irish anatomist named Michael McConnell. But he was one who showed us how we can twist the foot plate and realign all of these joints, including the, the uh, tibio-talar calcaneal navicular joint. If we can externally rotate, well, I'll just go back. This is the classic adult acquired flat foot, abduction of the forefoot, significant internal rotation of the tibia and fibula as evidenced by anterior displacement of the lateral malleolus. If we want to correct this transverse plane deformity, we got to externally rotate the tibia. In so doing, we externally rotate the talus. Externally rotate the tibia and the talus, right there. And we have to keep in mind, the talus has no muscular attachments. In reality, it functions with the tibia. And as we, if we want to externally rotate the talus and correct alignment of the talonavicular joint, the best way to do it is at the level of the tibia. And we know from kinematic studies of patients with PTD or adult acquired flat foot, it's the transverse plane that dominates. And so if we want to correct this transverse plane deformity, which really is at the talonavicular joint, if we want to correct the talus, we have to correct the tibia. And so what we're trying to do with the Ritchie brace is grip the tibia medial and lateral and prevent excessive internal and external rotation of the tibia. And in so doing, we, we help stabilize the talonavicular joint. It's much easier to stabilize the talonavicular joint by controlling the long lever above than, than trying to put, put a foot orthotic under it and pr prevent subluxation. We have gait studies with the Ritchie brace where the primary control we found was in the tibial angle in the transverse plane. So <clears throat> basically, restraining internal rotation of the tibia, in my mind, is the best way to obtain control of this joint complex, which we call the acetabulum pedis. Yes, we can also use the foot plate of the AFO to control the frontal plane. Absolutely, I'm not downplaying it, but the combination of the two is very powerful. And so in, in closing, I've learned a lot about AFO treatment of the adult acquired flat foot. And for the first time, we've been able to go back and now see some suggestion 
of what the critical joint is in the adult acquired flat foot that we need to start going back and looking at in the developing child and see, I'm gonna show you a video of the, uh, in closing, the, the power we have of controlling this with a Ritchie brace. Now this is in the adult. And finally, uh, just to let you know, this webinar was sponsored by all of the Ritchie Brace distributors, which you can find on our Ritchie Brace website, www.ritchiebrace.com. And they're all listed there with links to their websites and they can provide you with a wealth of information of how to order the brace uh, for the adult acquired flat foot. I'm not suggesting it for pediatric flat feet at all, but I am suggesting more research into the pediatric flat foot so that we can prevent this. So I'm gonna close with that and see if there's any questions. Uh, Sarah, I can't see the question, so I'm gonna have to have you uh, um, read them. Not a problem. I can field those for you. Uh, we don't have any at the immediate moment. So I will, I just sh sent everybody in the chat a quick note that they can begin to, oh, here, here they come. <laughs> All right. So first question, what is your orthotic approach to the high level athletic adolescent acquired flat foot? Hi, uh, say that high level, I, I think, would they mean high level athletic adolescent? Mm -hmm. Okay. With, acquire, with flat foot. Yeah. Um, so, you know, in, in, I rarely see evidence of frank ligamentous disruption in uh, pediatric and adolescent patients. So therefore I don't need to use an AFO. I use an AFO when I know there's ligamentous disruption as evidenced by inability to perform a single foot heel rise, as well as the positive lateral forefoot test. So if we're using a, a foot orthotic alone, which is what I would use on an adolescent patient, um, it would be a, a, a rigid orthotic. Um, you, you know, uh, it would be a, a, at least a 3.5 millimeter polypropylene shell. I would go with a, as deep a heel cup as tolerated at least 18 millimeters. Um, I would definitely put a rear foot post. Uh, the critical part of the, of, of, of the flat foot deformity is the casting process. You must remove all forefoot supinatus deformity. You must pronate the forefoot on the rear foot and remove any acquired supination deformity so that that foot plate can impart a correction in the frontal plane of the forefoot on the rear foot. Finally, I do believe in medial heel scives, and I, I think it's a, a powerful adjunct. I don't hesitate to put a six millimeter medial heel scive. And finally, if there's significant forefoot abduction, I put a, four, a lateral flange, a lateral flange, not a medial flange. Okay. And I just was thinking, um, you can hear me, right? I'm not muted. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I can I hear you. We, we have a... Um, a resource about removing forefoot supinatus. Do we not? I believe it. Yeah, we have a video. So on the website. Yeah, I was going to put it. Yeah. I'll put that yeah, uh, have, link in the chat. Yeah, we have a patient education section. It has a video section. There's a video on the importance of forefoot supination deformity and flat foot. It. Yes, I see it. So I'm going to ask the next question and then I'm going to put this link into the chat okay. so people have access to that right away. Where does equinus fall into this equation? Um, oh, by the way, I stopped sharing. Is that okay? I think so. Yeah. And okay. actually it might be, I could actually share my screen in case um, I can show where these website links are. And yeah, such. That'd be great. Um, where, where does, say the equinus question again? So where does uh, equinus fall into this entire, this equation? Well, it, it definitely is a risk factor for uh, a, a development of many pathologies. And uh, if, if you have an, a, a pediatric flat foot with Aquinas, many authorities um, have already uh, admitted, yes, that, that is a patient that should be followed, if not treated. 
and that it definitely is a risk factor for adult acquired flat foot. And um, what, that paper on the boomerangs that I um, uh, quoted from Angela Evans, she, that was one of the three factors that she pointed out. Uh, excessive resting calcaneal stance eversion, forefoot abduction at the talonavicular joint, and equinus, which she measures with a, a lunge test, not an off-weight bearing goniometer, but a, a, a lunge test. All right. And next question. Has anyone done studies on using a medial heel wedge Kirby sky to put the calcaneus in the optimal position and see if the foot develops properly? Um, I don't know of a pro. Okay. So you're, you're at, uh, that would be a prospective study. And I looked, uh, you know, first of all, I, I would, I, I would urge all the readers to read this Cochrane review that was published just last year, 2022. Angela Evans is the lead author with Keith Rome as the uh, second author. And, um, it, it is a very comprehensive review of every paper published on foot orthotic therapy and the pediatric population. I don't recall seeing any paper that specifically focused on the medial skive, uh, let alone a paper that longitudinally, prospectively followed a group of pediatric patients over years to see if they improved based on that factor alone. Okay. Um, where does the pain come? Where does the pain come from in adult acquired flat foot? Yeah, so that's a great question. You know, the reason we stopped blaming the posterior tibial tendon as the primary factor is that the majority of patients who came in and present to clinicians, they don't point to the medial side of their ankle. They say the outside of their ankle hurts. And with further MRI imaging, we realize they're getting pain laterally from sinus tarsi syndrome and from abutment of the calcaneus against the uh, fibula itself. So it's the displacement of the structures laterally and the impingement laterally that really creates much of the pain. Um, the, the, the tendinopathy is really short lived in most of these patients. And by the time their foot collapses, um, the, the, the posterior tibial tendon uh, is, is not and, and never really was the culprit. All right. Can you please post that article on your website? Thank you. Excellent webinar. Thanks. Um, yeah, <laughs> I suppose we could do that. <laughs> post the what? The article that, uh, that you were referencing. Oh, yeah. Um, the, the Cochrane review. Yeah, I, I, I can give that to you. Sarah, you could post it. It's yeah. downloadable from the internet, but uh, anybody can get it, but I'd be happy to share it. Cool. And we could actually even on, um, so just FYI for everybody, um, you can still see my screen, correct? Yes. All right. So we will be putting, this webinar will be on the Practice Partner Academy archives page on at podiatry.com meetings.com, but the Richie Brace website as well under the education tab with webinars, you can see um, previously recorded webinars. So we will put this webinar on this page as well if you would like to see it at a later time. And then we could potentially, if I, I'll make myself a note, I could put a link to that specific study under the video as well. Great. All right. That was the last question so far. So gonna do a little countdown here to see if anybody else has anything at their fingertips. This is, a, we're more on time than we usually are though. So this is, this is pretty good. <laughs> yeah, I'm getting better. <laughs> <laughs> well, and I was confused because like I said about daylight savings time happening, I, it kind of sprung on me. I was like, how's it? It's, so well, for me, it's seven o'clock start time. And I know for oh. you, it's, it's what, did you have to start at five? Yeah. Yeah. But with the sun still being up, confused me. I almost I was afraid I was going to miss it. Um, all right. So uh, please explain again how supinatus screws up the cast. Um, well, I'll show you real quick. Let's see. I'm going to share. Can I share my screen? Yep. I will stop share and then that will allow you to share. 
Okay. Uh, let's see. I have a picture. So the video is pretty good. Um, let's see. <laughs> that's awesome. Oh yeah, by the way, yeah, that that that's our uh, formal version of the Richie <laughs> the, the prom brace. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So uh I show from current slide. So if you take any patient with adult acquired flat foot, and even some patients in, in adolescence, and you correct their rear foot to neutral you will see what looks like a high degree of forefoot varus. But by Root's definition, and by many's definition, a, a true forefoot varus is a fixed deformity. So here's a patient with adult acquired flat foot and I've inverted her heel. And as you see her first metatarsals off the ground, which means the forefoot's inverted, see? Now that looks like a big high forefoot varus, but if they have adult acquired flat foot, and what we really call supinatus deformity, not forefoot varus, it's reducible. So here's another patient. I've corrected the heel to neutral. You can do this weight bearing or non-weight bearing. The forefoot's inverted, but if I push down and it comes down and it's reducible, that's not a forefoot varus, that's called a supinatus. That means it's an acquired reducible deformity. It's reducible. It can be reduced with surgery. It can even be reduced with muscle activity by the peroneus longus over time. So with our foot orthotic, we want to encourage that ray to come down to the ground. We want to encourage the foot to assume this position, not that position. So we don't want to cast them in that position. We want to cast them in this position. Uh, you can sort of see this in a, in a uh, supine position off weight bearing, but you can see it much better when they're prone. So I'm going to show you a really great video of a patient with a high degree of forefoot supinatus deformity. In a prone position is the best way to see it. So we're going to put the heel in subtalar neutral. We're going to load the forefoot like root taught us. And look at that forefoot varus, big degree of forefoot varus, but guess what? It's all reducible. That's not just the first ray coming down, the entire forefoot is everting by, and I'm reducing that first, uh, or that forefoot supinatus by, you know, 20 degrees. It's reducible. So I want to do that when I cast her. So here I'm casting a patient just with a foot like that, like Root taught us where you just pronate the forefoot on the rear foot with one hand and you leave the first ray where it is. And uh, this is what you get, a really flat foot. And this is what the shape of the cast looks like. But if you take that same patient who has a reducible supinatus and push down, look at the difference in the shape of the cast. Big difference. Now you would look at this and say, there's no way I wanna do this because that's gonna make a high arched foot orthotic and the patient will never tolerate it. I can tell you it's just the opposite because what I've done here is take this foot back to where it was in a newborn or when it was, you know, when it was a young, before it became an acquired, adult acquired flat foot. By the way, you, you use two hands and you push down gently on top of the head of the first metatarsal while holding the foot still in subtalar neutral. You have to use two hands. One hand holds the foot like Root showed us. The other hand over here is pushing down on the first ray. Okay. Now, um, let me escape here. And you would say, well, what are those, you know, I, I can't do that. Uh, that. That's gonna ruin the cast. It really doesn't. It makes a much better fitting orthotic. I thought I had a picture of that, but I don't. But trust me, the only time we ever have problems with the Ritchie brace with adult acquired flat foot is um, when the doctor does this and forgets to do this. So correct the forefoot supination deformity. You get a much better fitting orthotic and you'll get a much better clinical outcome, a much more comfortable orthotic. Hopefully when that you, answers the question. When you pulled this up, 
it reminded me of the PM News ad we did. <laughs> so I sent in the chat, I'll share my screen, the chat to the link to this page. Just a sec. Yeah, uh, I have a video where I show these casts where we didn't correct supinatus. Mm -hmm. And then I show the cast when we do correct it and how much better of a correction and fit it gives to the foot orthotic and the brace. So it's worth taking a look at. It's just about a five minute video. Okay, cool. Um, okay, so now I get, get back to my questions. Where did my screen go? There it is. All right, so you may have answered this while you were going through your description, but um, so when casting, do you push up on the fifth met? Well, yeah, I mean, you should still cast the way Root advocated by pronating the forefoot on the rear foot. And that's done either by uh, Root said, you grab the fourth and fifth toes and you lift upward. Um, other practitioners, and it's perfectly fine to push up on the fourth and fifth met heads. You're trying to evert the forefoot on the rear foot. But when they have acquired supinatus deformity, you have to go one step further. You got to push down on the first ray to further evert the forefoot on the rear foot. Do you use a varus forefoot post with the first ray cut out? No. Um, I'll tell you, I hate, I never put, well, I shouldn't say never, but I would strongly discourage ever putting a forefoot varus post on any foot orthotic that has flat foot. Because all that does is invert the forefoot on the rear foot. And when you invert the forefoot on the rear foot, you automatically evert the rear foot. What I wanna do is pronate the forefoot on the rear foot. I wanna evert the forefoot, which inverts the rear foot. That all comes back to the twisted plate theory. And um, I'll probably do that on my next webinar. But all I'm gonna say is I do not like to invert the forefoot ever with a foot orthotic and definitely with a Ritchie brace. I wanna evert the forefoot on the rear foot with the casting process and sometimes with a reverse Morton's extension. And yes, I do like first ray cutouts. First ray cutouts are very helpful on uh, flat foot deformity because they encourage the first ray to plantar flex off the foot plate of the orthotic. So I'm a, I, I'm a big fan of first ray cutouts, yes. Oh, you're muted. Sorry, I always double mute. Because <laughs> okay. I'm very paranoid. Okay. That's all right. <laughs> so sometimes I forget to do the one. Um, so that right now is our last question. Um, again, I'll give a couple of seconds or a minute for anybody else who has a last minute question here. But if not, thank you. Amazing as always. And again, check the chat for some helpful links. But the most helpful link is richiebrace.com. Uh, there are so many resources for you, webinars, educational videos, like the clinical pearls for the casting, casting tutorials. Uh, I mean, there's blog, art, we've got the articles, research articles and then blog posts. And someone, oh. Okay, I was just making sure no one was raising their hands. So that's good news. And uh, so, yes, Dr. Perry says, thank you. And Great. thank you for being here. It's more fun when there's people in existence. <laughs> so, <laughs> but uh, again, if you missed something or you want to kind of go back and review something, these this webinar will be on the webinar page on Dr. Richie's website, richiebrace.com. And it will also be on the podiatrymeetings.com practice partner academy archives. So. See how many words I can get into <laughs> five seconds spiel. So we may have another webinar next Tuesday. We usually, as you know, we do these on Tuesdays. It's maybe being rescheduled. So we will keep you posted regardless. But um, thank you so much for everybody who joined us. Dr. Richie, always a pleasure. And thank you so much for just enlightening all of us. And of course, I'm not going to be able to utilize it, but... <laughs> Yeah, it's, I have an honorary GPM, right? Okay. <laughs>
So, right. everyone, thank you so much. Have a good night, and we'll see you again real soon. Bye-bye.